Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along to today's webinar, Falling Asleep at the Wheel, How Fatigue is Killing Our Drivers, Machine Operators and Workers, presented by Darren Cottingham. Guys, um, I just want to welcome you to today. I know everybody's pretty busy at this time of the year. There's quite a lot going on, so we do really appreciate you taking the time and participating in today's webinar. The same goes for Darren as well. Darren, if I can ask you just to go to the next slide. So, um, you will notice that all your mics have been muted and the chat function is there for you to have. If you have got any comments or suggestions or anything like that, please make use of the chat function. Also, we have a question and answer function. So if you've got any questions for Darren or myself, please make use of that. We'll try and do the questions as we can throughout the uh, presentation or if we, uh, if we feel like it uh, towards the end of the session today. If there's any available time left at the end of today's session, we'll open up the lines for any more uh, questions that can be asked to Darren or myself live. There will be four poll questions today, uh, pretty straightforward ones. They won't take up a lot of your time and they're all uh, anonymous. So please feel free to answer them honestly. We'll also share all the results quickly with you. Then Darren can just click on the next slide for me. Uh, next one, there we go. <clears throat> Guys, just uh, please don't forget, we are currently running the eight-part machine safety series with Brent Sutton. He's an extremely experienced individual when it comes to machine safety. He does a lot of work around enforceable undertakings with businesses. So he's really experienced when it comes to that. We've really done part one. It was really great success. Part two is happening next week, uh, the 22nd of November. So if you haven't seen part one yet, go over to our YouTube channel and go watch part one. Uh, before we register for part two it's only a 30 minute section session so please uh we i encourage you to uh, register for those next after that we've got chain of responsibility for supply chains with kelly mcclucky and paul gaynor both individuals from new zealand and australia they've done some excellent work when it comes to chain of responsibility in both continents and they're ready to pass on some of their expertise in that area so please watch out for that and register then we've got Matt Bennett. He did a bit of work around um, for us on a webinar called Violent Aggressive Behavior about a couple of weeks ago. You'll be able to find that also on our YouTube channel. But he's coming back for another stint regarding site traffic management on the 30th of March. One or two events that's not listed on yet, but the one I'll definitely mention is we'll do another session on violent and aggressive behavior with a company called Skills VR. And they'll show you some of the things they do, how to get immersive training um, and how to de-escalate those things. And we've done a couple of um, trial uh, uh, trials with them with other big retailers and some of the successes that came out there were really great and one of the workers have had to say is that it's been really really uh, successful and they remember quite a lot of the information that they that, that they've um, obtained from skills vr and that particular program then lastly uh, one more click for me please there uh, darren uh, just a bit more from, from shopcare side um, we are focused on critical risks, guys. If you haven't seen the critical risk webinar, please go to our YouTube channel. If you do want a copy of our critical risk report, and that report covers manufacturing, uh, retail, supply chain, warehousing. So please go ahead, grab a copy from our website. We do have other resources like hierarchies of controls. Um, we'll, we add as more as we can. Uh, we are a small organization, so just please be patient with us as we and more of these resources. We do have a driver safety guide, which is pretty comprehensive on the light passenger commercial side. Um, so if you wanna, if you're part of a driver program, you're thinking about a driver program, or just wanna see where you're currently at with your own driver program, I encourage you to get one of those, um, one of the report, not the report, but that guide and see um, where you fit. And we're adding bow ties as we speak. Uh, so please watch out for those. As mentioned a bit before, we're doing a bit of work with uh, Biotech behavior with Skills VR and uh, another organization, which I can't just mention yet. And then we'll be uh, also finishing up a site markings project for the regulator pretty soon. Then lastly, from a shop care perspective, guys, um, we are really focused on participative ergonomics and layman's terms, manual handling. Uh, where we'll be focused on early intervention, some injury management stuff, as well as actual manual handling planning, et cetera. It's, it will be based on the model uh, of Chazans. If you have, if you've seen that model before, it's, it's the campaign's called Work Should Not Hurt. It will be very similar vein as that, but uh, focused on our sectors. So please watch out for that. And I hope you will see you there to participate 
um, in that campaign. All right, now that's basically it from a shock care perspective. Um, what will happen is I'll switch off my camera so I don't distract any, uh, Darren or distract any of you uh, from listening to Darren. I'll still be in the background. I'll be monitoring all chats as well as questions. So I'll be a click away and I'll be, um, I'll, I'll be there if you definitely need me. So before I go, um, guys, I just want to welcome uh, Darren again. Darren, thank you very much for coming today. Um, a bit of a quick intro for everybody. Darren has spent most of his career either in the creative or in the educational sector. That is also a, a really good uh, musical composer and also an author of over 2,000 published articles. He's also the founder of Driver Test and a current general manager at the TR Group. Darren, thank you very much. I know you've got a busy schedule. I really do appreciate you taking the time. And I'll hand over that to you. Thank you very much, guys. See you later. Cool. Thanks very much, Wes. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Um, fatigue is this, uh, I found, fatigue is this massive topic. And uh, I'm going to kind of distill the findings um, from the production of this online course that we did. So as a, as a background, I run a driver training division in TR Group. It's DT Driver Training. It's a company that I started in 2010 and I sold it to TR Group and they put me on a kind of a one year non-parole period and four years later, I'm still here. Why does TR Group have driver training? Well, TR Group has 7,000 trucks and trailers and it's in their best interest to keep those trucks and trailers safe and the drivers that, that drive them as well. A truck can be worth as much as a Lamborghini. Uh, so 600 grand for a, a new truck and trailer. So TR Group has DT, which is the online side, which I manage. It also has uh, TR driver training. They have 20 driver trainers um, spread out all over the country. So how do we keep truck drivers safe? Well, we have 25 courses available online, but one of the most important in our view was a fatigue course that was accessible price-wise and location-wise to as many people as possible. So regardless of where you are in New Zealand, uh, you can do this course online. We couldn't have done it though without the input of these uh, seven experts. Um, plus uh, we did hundreds of hours of research and uh, this is the, the distillation of everything that they've said. So there's quite a lot of information. I do talk fast. People tell me uh, you can watch this on YouTube afterwards and choose like 0.75 uh, times speed if you want to go back and listen to it. We filmed these experts. We put the course together with additional information and voiceover with images, videos, and animations. You can see the course on drivingtests.co.nz. I'll recap that in the final slide so you can um, write that down. The benefits of having this course online is that we have a lot of literacy and language support. Uh, you can easily schedule it for when you have time. You don't have to book a time in a classroom. It's a low cost compared to a classroom course. And also these, these um, experts get to present themselves in person as opposed to a trainer kind of parroting what they've said. And I've had a look at a lot of fatigue related materials. I think this is a world class course. So let's dive into it. Now, let's this is a dangerous thing to say right at the beginning of a presentation. Let's fall asleep. Um, but we need to know what are those triggers uh, for falling asleep? Because certain triggers make you sleepy. The ideal conditions for falling asleep, it's dark, it's warm, it's comfortable. Maybe you've had something to eat. Maybe it's late at night or the very early morning. Maybe you've been up a while you've been doing the same thing for a while or you've got the, the sound of the wind or waves crashing in the distance. And now think about how similar is this to driving at night? So you've got the white noise from the tires on the road, you're watching the world coming at you through the windscreen, you're in a comfortable seat, you're in a dark environment and it's warm. Almost everyone has had situations when driving when they were falling asleep and um, especially during um, at-risk times. So these at-risk times are described perfectly by this graph. So we have uh, the red line, which is uh, how much you feel like you need to go to sleep. And you'll see that there's two peaks there. You've got a peak at around about 11, 12 at night, and another one about two in the afternoon. But your actual sleep need um, grows through the day, and it's due to a hormone that builds up in your, in your brain. And this kind of depends a bit on your normal bedtime. If you're a lark, if you like getting up early, you shift that graph an hour or two to the left. And if you're an owl like me, you like working late and getting up a bit later, then you shift it to the right. Now this describes sleepiness, which is technically different to fatigue. So what, what is the difference? Well, fatigue is when you feel exhausted. Uh, 
you're, it's not usually a pleasant experience. You're tired, but wired. You're easily distracted. You feel like you could go to sleep, but you can't go to sleep. Whereas tired is that you actually feel like you could fall asleep. And, and that's often a pleasant experience as you're drifting off. So tiredness can be caused by physical exertion, mental exertion, or you've just, you know, you've stayed, you've been up a long time. You know, that, that sleep pressure is built up. Whereas fatigue is what happens to you when you don't address tiredness over a longer period of time. But for convenience, what we're going to do is we're going to lump sleepiness and fatigue into the same basket. We're going to call it fatigue because that's what people talk about to mean both. And they both have similar consequences in terms of your, your performance. You start off being sleepy by accumulating a sleep debt. So sleep, a sleep debt is sleep that you owe yourself, basically. So if you get five hours sleep in 24 or 12 in 48 or 50 hours in a week, you've accumulated a sleep debt that means you're now functioning at about the same level as someone who's at the legal limit for drinking and driving. So one or two days of shortened sleep leads to sleepiness and doing that long term leads to fatigue. But there are other stresses um, that, that can cause fatigue and things like worry or sick kids or roadworks outside your house or you're ill or you just have persistent bad night sleep for another reason like the neighbor's barking dog. Ultimately, fatigue is an imbalance between the demands of life versus your ability to spend time recovering from them through sleep. So how do you solve fatigue? Well. Um, it's kind of a simple answer, but with complex um, implementation, because we just said that sleep is the thing that, that cures fatigue, but there's all these other things that contribute um, to fatigue. So let's, let's talk about the sleepiness part first. If you've been on holiday recently because you couldn't while, you were, while it was COVID, then you'll know that the worst part of the holiday, unless you've got a private jet, is the, the right at the end of the holiday. So it's the flight back followed by the jet lag. And the last time that um, I had that, so I went to Italy because my wife's Italian. So uh, my strategy for dealing with jet lag is to just basically stay awake as long as possible. And then your body's just grateful to go to sleep at any time. And so I'd had four hours sleep in 54 hours and I was desperately trying to stay awake. And we got to the place we were going to in Italy, near Bologna, and the internet connection was really slow. And I was trying to catch up on doing some invoicing, like things that are coming while I was flying. And zero was really slow and I was clicking and it would take me five or 10 seconds or take the screen five or 10 seconds to refresh. And I was having these micro sleeps. So I was nodding off and then waking myself up as my head whipped um, in the time it took to render the page. And clicking the mouse is technically an activity that, that theoretically should make me alert because I'm doing something and then I'm expecting something. But I had actually made myself so tired that my adrenal glands had run out of, of, uh, of energy to, to keep me awake. Now, there are people who drive like this as well. So we have, um, we have a, a person that works for us here. And he used to work, started at midnight, worked through till two o'clock the next day, driving a truck between Mount Monganui and Gisborne. And he would get home um, about three, pick his kids up from school. His wife would get home at six. They'd have an hour and a half together before he went to bed at 7.30, set his alarm for um, 10.30 to get up to go to work for midnight again. So you, you can't do that. You, you're actually, you're running on empty and, and you, you're having these micro sleeps. So what happens when a driver actually falls asleep? We're going to watch a video. Um, hopefully you can see this. So remember to watch the top and the bottom screen if you can. So at the moment we've got this driver and he, he's, his eyes are starting to close. And you'll see his steering motion. So he's, he's drifting in the lane at the moment. Now he's awake. He's trying to look around. Now he's driving by Braille. So he's about to hit the rumble strip, which will wake him up. And he does a sharp correction in the steering wheel. Now, at the moment, the road's quite straight. So he's, he's hitting the rumble strip, and then, rumble strip, and then he's hitting the cat's eyes in the middle. That's waking him up. But you can't keep going on like this forever, having these micro sleeps. Eventually. The road's going to have a turn that you can't cope with, or you're actually just going to fall asleep. And we can see that here. Now he's drifting. He's gone too far. He's gone to sleep. And suddenly, physics is definitely not his friend. He's got a truck that's probably at least 20 or 30 tons, and that's going to dig in, and it's rolled over. Now, that was fortunate that it was a dual carriageway with no vehicles approaching. 
so he didn't have a head on. What's very common, common accident, particularly in New Zealand, because we have quite windy roads, is a person falls asleep, and they drift across the centre line and they smash head on into another car. And we saw that last year with this awful accident with a minibus full of 11 people, most of them died. And that was a fatigue related accident. Uh, and even yesterday I saw in, on stuff, there was a guy that had killed a couple of people through falling asleep at the wheel at two in the afternoon. And there was no other reasons that he should have fallen asleep. He hadn't drunk, he hadn't taken drugs. He was a healthy young male, but two o'clock in the afternoon, that's when he fell asleep and he crossed the center line and he hit a car and it killed two people. So first question, if you can run the question, please, Wes. In the last year, have you fallen asleep or do you suspect you've fallen asleep while driving? We'll give a couple of more seconds for to answer before I end the poll. Okay, and I'm sharing the results now. Cool. Yep, I can see that. So what's really interesting is, so 77% of you think that you haven't fallen asleep while you've been driving. Now, the problem is with micro sleeps is you don't know that you've fallen asleep. When we ask this to professional truck drivers and we say, in the last month, have you fallen, do you think you've fallen asleep? About 50% of them will say yes. Now, obviously, you know, they often have pretty kind of horrible schedules getting up in the middle of the night. But in general, people do have micro sleeps when they drive. Um, not saying that you people who answered no uh, uh, weren't perfectly awake, but in professional drivers, they're aware often that they're having these sleeps. But scheduling means that they have to sort of push through. So, um, what can we do? Or what, can, what causes fatigue while you're driving? Well, driving familiar routes is a, is a major issue because you turn off. And the majority of accidents happen within eight kilometers of home. Um, making a decision to do something, that can also uh, cause your brain to switch off. So you go, all right, I'll stop at the service station I know is there in five kilometers. Um, well, then your brain doesn't have to think about that anymore. And there's a, a famous example that's given in BP's training of a, of a truck driver coming up through Mercer, decided he was going to stop at the next service station, and immediately after that, found himself sliding down the motorway on the side because he had, he had run into the median barrier and it had flipped the truck on the side. Um, sitting in traffic, that can cause you boredom, lack of stimulation, monotonous roads. This is a huge problem in Australia where you've got these massive long straight roads where the scenery doesn't change very much. Task fatigue, so driving for a long time or operating a forklift for a, a long period of time or operating a piece of machinery for a long period of time, the part of your brain that deals with that just gets tired. Driving when you'd usually be asleep, so your circadian rhythm, you adjust to that. That's why we get jet lag as well because your body wants, wants us to go to sleep at a particular time. Uh, the cab is too warm, uh, so we covered that previously as well. That's one of the things that, that helps you go to sleep, being at the right temperature. Now, things you can do to stave off sleep while driving. So it's not ideal. So ideally, you don't want to stave off sleep while driving. You want to actually stop. But if you, do, if you are in a situation where you need to get another 30 minutes or so of alertness, then you can listen to music and sing. It keeps your brain occupied. You can open the window and keep the cab cool. You can drink coffee, but bear in mind that the effects of caffeine take about 30 minutes to come in. So yeah, then you're going to make yourself have a worse night's sleep as well. So that can compound because then you're more tired the next day. Um, what doesn't work is uh, pinching yourself or you know, causing yourself pain. Um, so as I say, you're only going to get about 30 minutes, maybe 60 minutes of extra alertness doing this. The best thing to do is stop and have a power nap. So people will tell you different time frames for power naps, but generally if you sleep for more than 40 minutes, you're gonna enter deep sleep and then when you wake up, you're gonna feel terrible. You're gonna be groggy with sleep inertia. So 15 to 30 minutes is ideal, but literally any amount of sleep, even if it's five minutes, uh, is better than no sleep at all. And what it does, it can give you another couple of hours of extra alertness and it, it reshapes these curves. So this red line here, your sleep need goes down 
so your sleep urge goes down and then your sleep need comes down as well but it, it will rejoin the line a few hours later so you can't postpone it indefinitely with power naps but it reshapes those curves if you're um, if you're driving with someone it's helpful to understand what the signs of fatigue and sleepiness are um, and some of them are, are obvious uh, so yawning for example it's a natural biological sign um, you can yawn just by talking about yawning as well so I, I can't see you so yawn away tired eyes uh, they've been open too long and and what happens is you stop blinking um, and you start fixating and staring so your eyes get tired and sore and um, so you're becoming fixated so you stop scanning so the ideal thing when you're driving is that you need to be looking in the distance and looking close and looking in the distance and and looking close um, you can become restless so you feel the need to move in your seat quite a bit you can be drowsy so your eyes start um, drooping your head moves forwards you might find yourself whipping so your you know your head nods and you you know you, your head whips back again um, at that point you've already been having micro sleeps so if you've got to that point when you're driving that's after you've started having micro sleeps because with micro sleeps you don't know you've gone to sleep your brain goes to sleep for one or two seconds your eyes stay open and you saw that with that truck driver and we'll see another example in a minute where the driver does not close his eyes but he actually has gone to sleep and he doesn't see what's unfolding you can become irritable so if you're usually disagreeable you'll be ex especially disagreeable if you're usually sunny and of a great disposition then you might find things start becoming annoying like other traffic um, or people in the car um, waning attention that's usually missing signs so you've missed that the speed limit has changed or you've missed an intersection um, poor concentration you can't hold focus on a topic um, or your brain's all over the place, or if someone's talking to you, you can't focus on what they're saying, um, you become forgetful, you can't remember driving through that town you just passed through. That was something that driver said to us who works for us. He would get to Apotiki and not remember that he had driven through Fakatane. So it was just, he was on autopilot, he was just really tired. Um, you have slow reactions um, because you're tired, um, and you can feel bored so the tendency in this particular scenario is to speed up because it gives more visual input and your brain kind of tricks you into thinking well if i can get this bit over with now yeah as soon as possible then that'll be great so um drivers often make bad choices like this and that's why training and systems are, are important so let's um have another question can you put this one on please wes Has anyone in your company had fatigue related accidents either in a vehicle or while using a plant or machinery? Hmm. All right, guys, I'll give you a couple of more seconds to answer this question. And I'll be closing it in the next five seconds. Okay, share wow. the results. Yeah, that that's uh, huge, isn't it? And especially because it can be quite difficult to determine what a fatigue-related accident is. So um, we'll talk about that in a sec. I'll, we'll just show you um, another uh, video here. So this is an example where the driver is having micro sleep. So you can see his mouth is. His mouth has come open, that's a, a good sign that he's asleep. He's not actually closed his eyes, but he's definitely fixated there and he's not paying attention. Suddenly the, the passenger realizes. So that, that was quite a serious uh, accident. Now the thing is, when, you talk, when we talk about fatigue related crashes or when police investigate a fatigue related crash, it can be quite difficult, but there's some some telltale signs so no skid marks or braking is one of them you've basically you've run off the road there's no sign that you've tried to stop running off the road for example or you've you've had a head-on crash with uh, no braking on on one side obviously the car coming towards you would have tried to evade so full speed head-on or you've run off the road often low to medium speed no, speed nose to tail obviously that was a fairly high speed nose to tail that the guy just had but low medium speed nose to tail happens when you're in rush hour traffic stop start you just kind of 
drift off and suddenly you run into the back of the car in front. And then at risk times of the day, so midnight till 6 a.m. and also around mid-afternoon, so two or three o'clock, sometimes um, you'll feel like, especially after you've eaten lunch, that that will be the time when you start feeling sleepy, that your body is both kind of starting to digest, but also you've got that natural circadian rhythm bump there where you need to go to sleep. So how many fatal crashes involve fatigue? Well, how many do you think? How many do you think? Uh, I'll tell you the answer. It's at least 10%, but probably 15 to 30. And the reason is, the reason why it's very difficult to quantify is that family and lifestyle factors can remain hidden from accident investigators. And, and drivers don't always know that they've gone to sleep either. Uh, and you know, if a driver dies, you can't ask them. So you can only you can only kind of guess at some of these. Now, there's about five rollover crashes a day in New Zealand. So this is trucks, trailers, and cars rolling over. Um, I tracked six truck rollover crashes two weeks ago. Um, these are just ones that I could find out about. Um, three of them were caused by drivers going to sleep. Well, fortunately, none of them were serious, um, but they all ended up with the, basically the truck um, on its side. So if you're managing drivers, then people's reasons for their fatigue could be hidden from you because they are personal reasons. They're reasons they're not willing to share with you or, or, or perhaps they don't know um, about fatigue. <clears throat> so the way to mitigate this is to have systems and training so that those people actually start to understand fatigue. Unfortunately, we're our own worst enemy. So we uh, spend a lot of our time delaying sleep time by binge watching. Uh, I've binge watched three of these four or doom scrolling on Facebook, you know, like endless, endless scrolling uh, or by uh, entertainment and socializing by hanging out with friends. And so we really we wanted to go to bed, um, but we couldn't go to bed because uh, we were out at the show. Now, um, Dan Ford, who's one of the experts that we used, he said that a significant proportion of the people that go to him thinking they've got a sleep disorder have absolutely nothing wrong with them they're just burning the candle at both ends so they're, they're electing not to have enough sleep um two hours sleep loss and one night is noticeable and it can take uh two days or two nights of good sleep to return yourself to normal so you know staying up to watch the final episode of something can have an implication that lasts for a couple of days how do you know if you're getting enough sleep though well, there's, unless you're a, a kid, then the average adult needs between seven to eight hours of sleep. And if you've not had enough sleep, then you'll find it easy to get back to sleep. So if you wake up and you can get back to sleep, you've not had enough sleep. Um, if you sleep more on the weekend, then you're you know, depriving yourself of sleep during the week. There are factors that influence how good your sleep quality is though, because it's not just quantity, it's quality. You need to get into those kind of deeper levels of sleep. So you've got work-related factors. So have a think about in your business when the start and finish times are and whether they are good for the people who are working for you. We talked about larks and owls earlier. So if you're an owl like me, so I like, um, I like working at night. Um, so I, leave, I often leave work early in the afternoon and then I'll do two or three hours at night. And then I might go to bed at midnight. But I hate driving in traffic. So... Therefore, I want to set my alarm for six so I don't have to kind of trundle along with everyone else on the motorway. So what I'm technically doing there is I'm shortening my potential for sleep by two hours. Because really, if I go to bed at 12, I should be sleeping until eight. But I'm not. I'm getting up at six. So this is kind of a, a phasing issue with the sleep. And then you have larks who they like to get up early. But then unfortunately they have friends and friends want to see them at night. And so while they might want to be going to bed at eight, um, they have to stay up till 10. And so they've got a, uh, an issue with the phasing as well. So you've got work related factors. You've got, uh, sorry, I didn't advance that biological related factors. Um, other biological factors are your um, overall health and whether you have insomnia. So if you have insomnia, you're 30% more at risk of having an accident. Um, you've got your body clock. So things like daylight saving increase the, the 
um, number of accidents by 20 something percent. I can't remember the exact figure, you'll find it online. Auckland University did a study about it quite a while ago, I think related to car crashes. Panel beaters love daylight saving, they love daylight saving. Um, food and drink, so your intake of caffeine, your intake of sugar. Um, as I mentioned, I went to Italy. Italians love eating late. Like they love having dinner at 9.30 or 10 at night. I cannot do that. I need, to, I need to eat at seven. I need to be digested before I go to bed. Otherwise, I have a bad night's sleep. Events and stress. Things like relationship issues, financial issues. They can keep you awake or stop you from going to sleep because you're rolling around those things in, in your brain. Um, social cues. Uh, you're out. You want to go to bed, but it's not socially acceptable for you to leave before they've cut the birthday cake. Cultural issues. So there's um there's a word in Japan called karoshi, which means death by overwork. And um, to make a word for it, it's got to be a problem, right? Um, and it's the same in South Korea. So Japan and South Korea have the the two worst average amounts of sleep of any country. Um, and it's a this cultural thing. It's about and there's a lot of work, basically. They work long hours. It's bad form to leave the office before the boss does. The third worst is Saudi Arabia, and that's because you've got to get up to do prayers at four in the morning. So those uh, countries average 6.25 to 6.5 hours of sleep. New Zealand actually ranks quite near the top. We average about 7.75 hours of sleep, but we still do have quite significant issues with, um, with fatigue and fatigue-related accidents. So finally, you've got family obligations. You might need to get up at five to take your kid for swimming, or you might be doing some renovations, so you want to work later in the night painting the lounge. So uh, we have those kind of things that mean that we are either getting up too early or, or going to bed too late. Now, we talked about the biological factors here. I'm going to run through really quickly some um, some illnesses. I'm not a doctor, though, so this isn't medical advice. If you recognize any of these, probably should talk to either a sleep um, expert or, or a doctor. So we'll go through the most common one, sleep apnea. Uh, so when your breathing is interrupted uh, while asleep, and it can happen as many as hundreds of times a night, um, literally almost every breath. Um, you're at risk if you've got a neck circumference of more than 43 centimeters. That was research that came out of studying hundreds of truckers in the UK. If you smoke or drink, they relax the throat muscles. If you sleep on your back, your tongue falls backwards and blocks your airway. If you are Asian or Polynesian, you are genetically predisposed, unfortunately, to um, sleep apnea. For Asians, they tend to have smaller, lower jaws, so um, the tongue doesn't um, fit as well. It can fall back. And then Polynesians tend to carry more muscle and fat in the neck, which uh, collapses the airway. Um, Obesity is an issue because if, you, if you're carrying a lot of weight, it takes your lungs more effort to push um, air in and out. So you, you get um, hypoxia, so you get problems, you can't clear the carbon dioxide. And um, also if your neck is big as well. So with obesity, you can often have a big neck, so that neck circumference. Again, male, if you're male, you put on more weight more easily when you're younger. Um, if you've got comorbidities like congestive heart failure, high blood pressure, Parkinson's disease, or type 2 diabetes, they uh, will increase your sleep apnea um, uh, likelihood too. So a study in Australia found that 41% of heavy vehicle drivers um, have sleep apnea, and there are interventions like CPAP machines and things like that. Uh, if you're at all worried about it, then you can go and get a sleep study. Um, uh, it was interesting because... Um, we spoke to Andrew Veal from the NZ Res uh, Respiratory Sleep Institute. He took us through a sleep study. Um, we sleep overnight and you're wired up. It's brilliant. Um, tells you exactly how good your sleep is. Um, all right, now, eyesight. So we talked to an eye surgeon about this. Because what are your eyes doing when you're driving or when you're using a forklift or you're operating machinery? Now, if you're operating machinery, you're probably looking really close a lot. Uh, and that's very fatiguing in your eyes to hold your eyes in that vision, uh, that distance, sorry. When you're driving, you're looking in the distance, you're looking close, you're looking in the distance, looking close. Driving for short distances is fantastic for your eyes. It's like a little mini workout for your eyes. But like any workouts, uh, too much, there's too much of a good thing. And so there's two types of eye discomfort that you can experience. Um, 
and they uh, will contribute to your overall fatigue level. So the first is discomfort. So if, if you imagine your eye as a globe, so you've, you've got um, a globe that's covered in a shallow salty sea and that salty sea is your tear film. So every time you blink, that sea is replenished, but then it evaporates and it leaves salt crystals on your eye. So that makes your eyes all itchy and scratchy. Um, so it's why you shouldn't point the air conditioning at your face when you're tired. Um, now, I mentioned before that you start staring when you get fatigued, so you don't blink as much. So that's when your eyes start getting tired. Um, the second one is we talked about time on task. So the longer you do something, the more that part of your brain fatigues. So loss of visual function is when your tired brain can't merge the image from your left and right eye. So you've got a part of your brain that merges these two images. When it gets tired, uh, it starts going blurry and you feel like you can't focus. So when we're fatigued, we don't look around as much. Um, we become fixated and then our eyes become uh, scratchy and so we blink a lot more. Uh, but we're still not looking around. Um, now, both of these can be solved by rest. Uh, so the other thing that happens when you're tired is you have long blinks. Um, at 100 kilometers per hour, when you do a tired blink, you travel about 11 meters blind. So, But a normal blink, you only travel four meters. So that seven meter difference could be the difference between uh, being able to stop um, for the car that's braked in front of you or not. Uh, at night, you, there's less light and your pupils are bigger, so you have visual aberrations. That makes it more difficult to see. Um, nighttime vision is blurry. Uh, you can um, help this by wearing glasses if you need it and making sure your windscreen is clean. Also, um, the older you get, well, uh, everyone gets cataracts, basically. So. Uh, if you live that long, if you live long enough, you'll get a cataract. And as your lens goes cloudy, it diffracts the light. So you get what's called disability glare. So eventually you can't see. Uh, and trying to overcome that when it's not a, a bad level is more cognitive overload on, the, on your brain. So um, all of this means that nighttime driving is like twice as taxing on your brain as daytime driving. So four or five hours of nighttime driving is the same as roughly eight to nine hours of, of daytime driving or machine operation. So same with you know, operating a forklift. So you want to keep, if, you, if you've got a warehouse, you really want to keep those lights as light as possible for that reason, but also um, because light is going to stave off that um, need to sleep. So whole circadian rhythm. So slow reactions, oh, so we've covered that. All right, so I'm going to breeze through a list of illnesses. Again, so I'm not a doctor, but I'll give you a kind of a one sentence overview of each one, and then you can decide whether you need to take it um, any further. So digestive issues, gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, or heartburn, this can uh, keep you awake and therefore eventually cause fatigue. Heart failure. Um, and fluid retention. So if you get fluid retention around your legs, when you lie down, all that fluid redistributes itself through your body, particularly around your lungs, and then um, makes it more difficult for you to breathe and it wakes you up. Coronary artery disease um, can cause pain and also um, alter your circadian rhythm. If you've got musculoskeletal disorders or you've got injuries, just even moving in bed can be a bit painful. Restless leg syndrome, my wife had this really badly when she was pregnant, um, and it can be caused by things like iron deficiency or anemia or kidney disease, um, and anemia itself also causes um, fatigue. If you have to keep getting up to go to the toilet in the middle of the night, um, it's called nocturia. This can be made worse by if you breathe through your mouth when you're asleep, or if you've um, got liver failure or enlarged prostate or diabetes. Stress, so you wake up worried. Um, that happened to me when I bought a house pre-COVID, but had to settle after COVID had um, been announced. So that was worrying for me for a couple of months. Now, overall mental health, like anxiety and panic attacks, depression causes you to wake early. Um, migraines, obviously headaches are going to wake you up. Um, itching prevents you from getting to sleep and can wake you up. And then cold feet. So some of these are easier to mitigate than others with lifestyle changes. But um, some of them you might need uh, medication and drugs. So um, some medications make you drowsy. Some of them recommend that you don't drive or use heavy machinery. So you should check the prescription with your doctor. So if, if it's something you do is driving or operating machinery or um, 
something dangerous, then you don't want to be taking um, drugs that, that hamper your ability to function. There are five different drugs that cause insomnia in the long term. Um, the first one is beta blockers, and they have names that end in LOL, like propranolol. Second is SSRIs, um, so antidepressants, basically, um, like Prozac. Third is nicotine. So if you're a smoker, smoking will contribute to you having uh, long-term insomnia. Diuretics that force you to lose water. And also sleeping pills, uh, which you wouldn't expect, but sleeping pills you use long-term um, will, will cause insomnia. Now, it's the same with recreational drugs. Uh, marijuana slows your reactions down. Uh, but it also causes long-term, uh, with long-term use, it causes insomnia. And then if you use things like cocaine and methamphetamine, so uh, some truck drivers use this to keep them awake, but then they have a, a massive kind of come down later on and they don't get a good night's sleep. So, so other stuff you can put in your body, which, um, you know, food and drink, also affects your fatigue levels. We, we're filming a, a diet related course at the moment, which we're gonna give away for free and it's targeted at drivers and machine operators. And this is the, the dietitian that we use for the fatigue course, Angela. Um, this is us filming the amount of sugar that's in each of these uh, drinks. So drivers often pick the wrong things because sugar will give you a kind of a high and then a crash. So actually you might feel a bit better for 15 to 30 minutes, but then your sleepiness after that is, is worse. And you've got two schools of thought with drivers. Some drivers are like, I don't want to drink because I, you know, I don't want to stop because where do you park a 20 meter truck when you need to go to the loo? And then other drivers that we've spoken to, they're like, I drink and then I use the fact that I'm busting to go to the toilet to keep myself awake until I can get to the next place. Uh, but then they end up with bladder issues. So it's a bit of a kind of rock and a hard place. Obviously, the ideal scenario is drink normally and stop every two hours. That's you know, roughly a person's regular interval of uh, going to the toilet. Now, as you get older, you don't feel thirsty as much. And I'm not even going to cover food because food is just such a massive topic. If you are worried about your diet and thinking that it's causing you fatigue, then um, someone like Angela, who's a dietitian, is the perfect person to talk to. Um, shift work is uh, something that that people really struggle with. When you're young, you can kind of cope, but you never really are able to cope fully with shift work. And the older you get, the more difficult it becomes um, because it's difficult sleeping during the day, basically. Um, when you're fatigued, you have slow reaction times and lower productivity. So shift workers suffer from this and um, have lower alertness. And then when they go home to sleep, the neighbor's kids are on the trampoline or you know, someone's mowing the lawn next door or there's traffic um, or they can't make their bedroom dark enough. And so they have poor recovery sleep. Um, consequently, you know, with the fatigue, nighttime drivers are up to seven times more likely to have a crash. And it's not only, you know, these kind of impacts, these kind of um, impacts in their productivity, but if they're doing a job where they might need to have some kind of creative thought or problem solving or remember things or make decisions, um, then, then all of those become empirically worse. So when you measure them, they're all worse. And then if you're working at night, well, are you going to be in the best mood anyway? And then your mood swings worse. And so uh, it can be more difficult to manage people who work night shift because they can be more tetchy um, with being tired, um, generally can be more disagreeable. So next question, please, Wes, do you have any fatigue awareness training in your company? We'll give it a couple of 10 more seconds for everyone to give everybody a chance to answer. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm going to close it now. Okay, so uh, just over half don't. I know this awesome fatigue course that you can, uh, anyway. Um, so uh, if it's a badge of honor in your workplace to work late or long hours, that's actually, um, it's a bad sign for fatigue. And I've worked in companies where it's like that. Ad agencies are the worst, the worst, hands down. 
um, ad agencies. I've heard lawyers are pretty bad as well, and also medical, you know, doctors, um, uh, hospitals, sorry, um, are pretty bad for this kind of uh, culture of, you know, just put in the hours, put in the hours. So it's really not good. Now, if you um, just close that poll, so. Um, if you uh, are in the chain of responsibility, then uh, that, uh, for example, a driver, a loader, and a dispatcher would all be in the chain of responsibility. If the driver has an accident, then WorkSafe would do things like, well, look at was the scheduling particularly bad? You know, could they have done anything with the scheduling? So, and that goes right up, obviously, through the PCBU. Um, what you need to do is to have fatigue related training for everyone in the chain of responsibility so that it's not all put on the driver because it's if the driver is uh, if the driver has to kind of adhere to a schedule then it's the people that um, are setting the schedule that actually need to be aware of that and they just might not know like it's not something you learn at school it's not something you learn when you do your driver's license it's something that is a huge topic that people need to be made aware of. So there are obligations under the Health and Safety Work Act for the PCBU. Also, the responsibility of the worker is to turn up fit for work, but they might think uh, their idea of what is fit for work might not include not being tired because their personal family situation might mean that they are just tired. But like I've got an eight month old baby, so I know what tiredness is and he woke us up at three o'clock this morning which was the one time which is the first time it's only been once so uh, over the past eight months i've been quite tired but i've been conscious of it so i've been going home and having a nap to mitigate that and then making sure that i try and get in bed by nine rather than my usual 11:30, so that by the time six comes around that i've had a chance to have a sleep and other people who are in this scenario might not even think about kind of this sort of intervention that they can make themselves. Um, so obviously the PCBU, the manager, the business owner has a responsibility. Um, so you can uh, ask yourself fatigue management questions. There's uh, things you can find online to sort of discover what questions you should ask in your business, or you can use a, a fatigue management consultant like Fiona, who is in our video, uh, she's really good. Now the final um, slide before the recap is there is some technology that you can use um, in vehicles and it works on uh, five uh, different sort of aspects of driving. So we've already talked about blinking. So if your blink frequency is abnormal, then you're either uh, staring like you're fixated or your eyes are getting tired and you're over blinking. So it can monitor blink frequency and then there's your eye position so as you get tired your eyes droop and your head goes forward <clears throat> uh, you can have basic timers which are saying every two hours it reminds you to have a break um, it can look for distractions as well so distractions are like you looking at your phone um, it can look at the steering input so remember in that video where the guy rolled the truck he was making those fast steering uh, corrections as he suddenly realized that he, he'd gone off course and then uh, you can monitor the, the braking as well. So fast, uh, um, so sharp braking is something that telematics can monitor because sharp braking is not abnormal. So, so there's your kind of, uh, sorry, it's six, not five. Maybe I'm tired, um, babies, isn't it? Um, okay, so the final slide for me is just a recap. Sleep is the only cure for eliminating sleepiness, but it's a simplistic answer to a complex um, question because there may be other factors that are contributing to your sleepiness which can lead to fatigue which is a much more complex issue with multiple potential causes we talked about the um, medical um, issues we talked about the work pressures like scheduling um, there's your own personal kind of uh, uh, willingness to go to sleep rather than uh, get all that dopamine from just you know watching those extra episodes or scrolling through Facebook you have an increased accident risk when you're fatigued. So roughly 30%, kind of depends what you're doing. Um, also 30% more risk when you have insomnia, uh, seven times more likely to have an accident when you're driving at night. And the ideal thing is drivers and machine operators must be made aware of fatigue and how to manage it. Because ultimately through that chain of responsibility, 
the PCB you're responsible for fatigue's effect. And there are things that you can do to help your, um, your team members uh, mitigate their fatigue or uh, even solve their fatigue issues. Now, as I mentioned, we have the course, which you can get to by going to that web address there, clicking on courses and searching fatigue. It's $60 uh, plus GST per person. You get access for six months. It takes a couple of hours to do the course. It's all online. Uh, we have had really, really good feedback about it. We've got quite a few trucking companies using it and coach companies. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, now. Thank you very much uh, for that. Aaron, uh, guys, we've got one more poll question um, coming up before we hit, go into the actual Q and A's. Uh, last poll question, guys, uh, coming up now. Has this webinar been of value to you and to do things differently? Yes, I found it of value and will do things differently. Yes, it's been great to obtain confirmation of what I already know. Uh, or no, I just didn't learn anything new today. Give you a couple of seconds to answer that one that'll be super helpful darren while we wait um there's one question that's really popped up and the question basically is you, in our current climate you know where there's a pretty big shortage of drivers and there's a big increase of demand for for goods where is the balance or what is the solution um to to mitigate the fatigue it's a complex question isn't it because truck drivers to be efficient drive at night so they avoid the traffic um, and if you drive during the day and it takes you a third as long to reach your destination then there's a third more tra uh, travel costs basically so we have um, work time rules and those rules are like a truck driver can only work 5.5 hours before a half hour break and then another 5.5 hours before a half hour break and then another two hours so it's 14 hours that's actually more we're allowed to work more in New Zealand than you would be allowed to work in Australia or Europe, uh, where I think in Europe it's 12 hours. And in Australia, they're big on the kind of the two up driving where you have drivers that, that swap over um, in the cab. So you could argue that the solution would be to make it more realistic for drivers to get home, have some kind of life and get a good amount of sleep. But the reality in New Zealand is because we're sparsely populated and these drivers have to get to places it's sometimes quite difficult to achieve the runs between the cities and still stay within those work time rules so if if we did solve this problem you would end up having things that are a bit more expensive but i mean in my opinion if you drive if you're driving to work an hour and then an hour back well, your 10 hours is now eight hours and then you've got to eat and you've got to go shopping you've got to have a dentist appointment and you've got to play with your kids and so then you're down to four hours or three hours sleep. So, yeah, we've got a bit of an unhealthy regime around work time, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. Um, thanks for that. Um, this next question is pretty much we just uh, left off on, and there's there's a lot of factors that is beyond the employer's control that could influence the the sleep. You know, like you mentioned earlier on in your in your webinar, culture, events, food and drink, and family obligations. What can an employer do without stepping over the line um, of workers? You know, they get that feeling that, you know, you're trying to control my personal life as well. Yeah, so what we do here at TR is we are very big supporters of uh, the Gumboot Challenge and what Mike King does with I Am Hope. Um, and so that's on the, the mental health and awareness. We have a, a, an employee gym which is $5 a week. And that was set up by one of the guys that works here who was a world CrossFit champion. Um, and we run a Biggest Loser uh, Championship uh, every year as well to try and keep people fit and um, happy. And in general, uh, and then the other thing we do is we um, have awareness of fatigue. Uh, and I mean, there's probably other interventions you can do, but that's just what we do here. Um, obviously we are acutely aware of fatigue because we're in the transport industry. And there'll be different things that are relevant for different other organizations. But I think I think what we do here strikes a good balance between not kind of stepping into people's personal lives too much, but giving them the opportunity to, to kind of get the help when they need it. Cool, cool. Thank you very much. Uh, guys, if you have got any other questions for Darren um, or myself, please ask them now. Um, I can always open up the lines as well. We'll give you like a minute or so. Um, to answer those but th that's pretty interesting um just a quick question from my end are those uh, technologies 
that you can implement from um, from monitoring a driver perspective are are they expensive or especially especially when it comes to the actual installment and the general maintenance of them uh, i'm not sure of the price but i suppose you've got to look at if you roll a truck the minimum that's going to cost you is 100 grand so if you roll like a b train like yeah. a, or a semi trailer then um, just repairing the truck. I mean, well, first of all, you've got to get the truck righted, which is no mean feat. Then you've got whatever freight was in there could be damaged. Um, the driver often needs counselling, so the driver's off work. Um, the truck itself is damaged. There's almost certainly going to be damage to some kind of street furniture or roadside stuff that you may or may not need to contribute to. I mean, insurance will cover this. Is uh, however much a month for camera that monitors um, fatigue like a better option given that we've got 2,000 rollover accidents a year you know mm. so I think it's a question that you'd need to kind of ask yourself more and more people I know are putting them in cars not not just trucks yeah so maybe one but, another good thing would be for example is for whoever is the instigator or not the, I won't call it instigator but the the proposer of this type of technology is to do a proper thorough ROI type of modeling you know and present yeah. that with the for their capex etc um because at the end of the day you know try, trying to calculate that type of cost if something goes wrong will uh, will most probably be the um light bulb mo light bulb moment for for a lot of execs yeah i mean i think there's there's plenty of providers i think you know if you're someone like countdown and you're doing metro deliveries during the day you're probably not it, it may not be worth it but if you're someone doing line haul through the night then you know scenarios are the potential scenarios there would mean that it might be worth it or even forklift shift drivers you know yeah, um, yeah. that's 600 forklift injuries a year yeah just go to the next slide please for me darren um guys uh, thank you very much for coming along today these are details both for darren um his email as well as uh, website as well as for shop keys details thank you yet again for coming along today we know we're very busy but we still appreciate you coming along and participating in the polls Darren, uh, I just want to give you a last opportunity for any other comments before um, I say goodbye to all our... No, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm spent. <laughs> I'm well done. Thanks for the opportunity. It's been great. And it's a pleasure having you, Darren. Thank you very much for sharing your experience on this, guys. And please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or definitely Darren if you want to know a bit more. And as Darren has also mentioned a little bit earlier on, he just, he's just discovered some of the basics when it comes around uh, fatigue. If you want to know a bit more, please reach out to him. He'll be able to assist you. Um, from me to you all, thank you very much for coming along. And I hope to see you on our next webinar, which is next week. Until then, see you guys. Have a good one.